I just got back uh, yesterday from a week-long uh, semi-annual meeting of the of the working group on mercenaries in Geneva where we um, essentially put together our working plan for for the year which includes uh, consideration of what countries we want to visit and and report on um, and I can tell you that on our kind of short list although we're awaiting um, the official invitations from the respective governments it looks like we will be able to um, make official visits this year to to Libya um, which has a recent and, and considerable um, history and a bunch of concerns about uh, mercenaries that I'll talk a little bit more about in, in a minute. Um, We're considering uh, and hoping to, to be able to get an invitation to visit Somalia, which as you know is um, fraught. Um, we are hoping perhaps sometime later in the year to be able to visit Honduras, uh, which is a country also in the throes of, of a great deal of, of turmoil these days. Um, in addition, the working group um, issues thematic reports. Um, we are going to be, uh, and these go to the General Assembly and to the Human Rights Council. The thematic report that we're constructing this year um, is going to be a survey of national legislation concerning um, the, uh, the standards for certification, vetting, um, scope of permissible activities and accountability measures under national law for uh, private military contractors. And um, there are also a couple of initi uh, other initiatives that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But I think the first thing that's important to do um, is to set the stage with, with a couple of definitional um, distinctions. The, um, my working group is, it has the word mercenaries in it, um, <coughs> but um, the, uh, the concept of mercenaries is, is really a, an extremely narrow one in international law. Um, it's, it's really difficult to be a mercenary, and if you are a mercenary, then you probably had a really lousy lawyer. <laughs> and the, the reason for that, the reason for that is that um, under the international convention, um, you are, well basically a, mer a mercenary is a soldier for hire. Um, but in order to fit the legal definition of mercenary under international law, um, you, you have to be not a resident or a citizen of the country in which you're doing your fighting. You have to be not a member of the armed forces of um, either of, of the, any of the parties to the armed conflict. You have to not be sent by a state. Um, and you have to be motivated pretty much exclusively by private gain. Um, so it's very difficult to, to actually um, you know, fall within all of, those, all of those criteria. And so the, the risk um, or the likelihood that someone is actually a mercenary is very small. And that's important because although mercenarism is generally frowned upon and there's an international convention against it, although not um, many states are party to that convention. Um, and in fact, under the, the basic instruments of humanitarian law, the, the additional protocol uh, number one to the Geneva Conventions that speaks about mercenaries, it doesn't outlaw mercenaries or mercenarism. Um, it creates a disability in a sense for those who are mercenaries. If, um, if you are a mercenary, then you are not going to be entitled to prisoner of war status should you be captured in the context of a war between State A and State B. Now, if it's an armed conflict between State A and a non-state armed group, or between non-state armed group A and non-state armed group B, then there's no such thing as prisoner of war status anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but that's basically the, the, the disability that international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, creates um, for mercenaries. And otherwise, unless you are um, affected by the mercenaries convention by virtue of your state um, being a party to it, or for that matter, there's an uh, African Union convention um, on mercenarism as well, 
but if your state is not one of, one of the parties to these conventions, um, then chances are even if you do um, end up having met the definition of mercenary, then your conduct as such um, will not be unlawful. Now, there are things that one can do as a mercenary that are unlawful. So, you know, you could commit war crimes just as well as anybody else can commit war crimes, but the status of, of mercenaries, mercenarism itself um, is, is, as I say, frowned upon, but not necessarily unlawful. Now, putting mercenaries aside for a moment, the, the more, I think the more attended to issue these days, and the one that you probably were thinking of um, when you decided to, or someone decided for you that you would come to this, um, this meeting, is the problem uh, and the issue of private military and security contractors. Now, um, private military and security contractors <coughs> may or may not be mercenaries. Say, chances are they're not. Um, and there is a much broader realm of activities that private contractors are involved in than pure uh, being warriors for hire. As the name suggests, they can be military contractors, they can be security contractors. So it could be someone um, doing, you know, nothing more or less controversial, say, um, than, you know, than cooking or driving um, or a construction project. But, um, and, a, and a security contractor may also be nothing more different than someone who, um, you know, guards a residence or guards an embassy. Um, the, the, the issues get more tricky, though, as employees of private contractors more and more closely approximate or start doing the things that have been traditionally left within the province of governments to do. Um, there is the concept of inherent government um, action or inherently governmental conduct. And perhaps the most uh, simple example, obvious example of that, is indeed what mercenaries do, fighting wars, um, being a combatant, directly participating in hostilities in an armed conflict. And um, as I said, there, there is no prohibition in international law of armed conflict against participating in armed, in, in armed <coughs> hostilities, even if you're not a member of, of the armed forces. So one of the significant issues that arises in the realm of international legal development concerning private military and security contractors um, is what should be the appropriate scope of the permissible activities for, for these contractors. Um, the, but that, that's only one issue. So the 1989 Mercenaries Convention and the African Union Convention on Mercenaries, as I said, they prohibit uh, mercenary conduct. The whole realm of uh, instruments and standards that I'll discuss in a moment concerning private military and security contractors also either prohibit or discourage the direct participation in hostilities in armed conflict by contractors. So in that sense, the rules um, that pertain to mercenaries and the rules that pertain to military contractors have some parallel. But while mercenaries are generally thought to be um, unlawful and in those, in those states where the, the mercenary convention and the African convention apply. Of course, there is no international legal prohibition against either being or using or, um, private military contractors. First of all, as I said, they, they can, uh, their activities can, can run and do run the gamut. But as military forces um, become more and more expensive to use, more and more politically um, unpalatable to use, uh, and 
have less and less of the breadth of expertise and, uh, and capabilities that are required out in the field in supportive roles for, for militaries. We're seeing an ever-increasing use of private military contractors. And so the question is not only um, how, if at all, do we decide, do we want to decide, A, that these military contractors should not be doing the work of and should not be becoming mercenaries. In other words, they should not directly participate in hostilities um, in, in armed conflict. But also, given that they don't necessarily um, answer to a chain of command that is, say, similar or as strict as within the military establishment itself, given that their obligations, if anything, are primarily contractual. If they go wrong, they violated the contract, and you take whatever measures are available for, uh, for the violation of, of the contract against them. Um, but there are also significant questions about the effect that the <coughs> conduct of military contractors have um, on foreign relations, uh, especially with a, with a host nation, um, on their compliance with local law, um, about their, their training and the, the vetting that does or does not take place to make sure that they understand um, what the legal uh, framework is and what the legal rules are within which they have to operate. And then perhaps also, last but, but certainly not least, and most importantly, are questions of legal accountability of military contractors. Because the armed forces have their own um, time-tested, and you, you, know, you may think for better or worse, but there is a very well-established methodology um, of accountability within the armed forces up and down the chain of command for those who do wrong. And it's, I think, safe to say that in the case of military contractors who are more and more taking up the tasks and the roles of uniform military, the, um, the methods and the assurances of accountability, whether it's criminal accountability um, or civil accountability, in other words, the availability of remedies to victims, is a much less certain universe. And so, coming back to the work of the, um, the Mercenaries Working Group, which is an unfortunately named um, entity because uh, what we do doesn't these days actually focus that much on mercenaries. It focuses more on private military and security contractors. And it is imp very important to, to understand the, the distinction between the two. Um, but the working group itself now is involved in a number of initiatives. And some of them are already in existence. Some of them we're working to bring into existence um, and having more or less success with. And I just want to tick those off for you. Um, and then I'll close. There is, in addition to the, um, the, the, these two interna international instruments dealing with mercenaries, um, a couple of more initiatives now. Um, one that is settled is called the Montreux document. Uh, because in Montreux, Switzerland was, was where it was negotiated. And it was a, an initiative of the Swiss government, um, of the International Committee of the Red Cross, where I used to work before coming to Human Rights First. Um, and the Montreux document uh, is, it performs two functions. It sets out an agreed set of legal frameworks and rules applicable to private military and security contractors. And it also then takes off from that point and enumerates a set of what the drafters and the adherents to the Montreux document consider to be a set of best practices for, for contractors. That's Montreux. <coughs> Post Montreux, there is now in progress the development of a uh, of a, an industry-led initiative by and for the industry of military contractors themselves um, called the International Code of Conduct. 
It's a voluntary membership um, process. Companies can become members of it. Um, the code of conduct has already been pretty negotiated and settled. What is now um, in progress is what's called the charter, which actually is the means by which the companies that are uh, signed up to the code implement um, the requirements of the code of conduct. And this initiative um, is an industry, as I said, is an industry-led initiative. My working group um, will be uh, submitting uh, comments to the proposed charter, which will be um, very critical of it. And the reason is that while the Code of Conduct um, is a relatively satisfactory document setting out um, some good uh, ground rules for what it takes for a company to be duly registered, what vetting they must do of, of their prospective employees, what, account, what internal uh, accountability mechanisms they must have um, and what, uh, what work they must do to determine the human rights impact um, of, their, uh, of their activities, and especially in connection with something called the Ruggie Principle, which is an initiative uh, within the UN system, um, a, a, a broad-based initiative having to do with the relationship between business and human rights. It's an extremely broad topic. And the code of conduct is you know, true to the salutary kind of purposes and, and, and provisions of, of the, the Ruggie uh, principles. But the charter, which is the implementation mechanism and which is now just in draft form, um, doesn't say much of anything about accountability mechanisms doesn't say anything about remedies for victims. It pretty much just limits the questions of accountability and remedy processes to, to that of whether or not a company has in place a methodology for determining whether or not a complaint should exist or should go forward or, 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 <laughs> um, or should be investigated. But there's no mechanism in, in the charter for actually um, or standards for dealing with the substance of a complaint by, say, someone who's been, been harmed by military contractors. So we're going to um, submit, as a working group, comments on the charter, and hopefully there, there'll still be some flex there. But you may have noticed that if this is the universe of um, kind of international legal documents that deal with military contractors, it still may not be sufficient. Because Montreau is just an explication of rules and a suggestion of best, best practices. The code of conduct is a purely voluntary mechanism, uh, an initiative by the industry to take uh, for itself. We still have not talked about the existence of a mandatory um, legal framework by which military contractors are held accountable, are liable um, to answer to, to, to those whom, whom they might have wronged as well as to, to the states involved. So this, of course, is the province primarily of domestic law. And a number of countries do have a domestic legal regime that deals with vetting, deals with registration, um, deals with qualifications, deals with uh, criminal accountability, and the establishment of civil remedies for victims of, of violations. Uh, but it's across the board. Um, it varies across the board. Um, so one of the other things, and the last initiative um, that I want to mention to you, is that there is now um, set up by the Human Rights Council an intergovernmental working group, not to be confused with my mercenaries working group. The purpose of this intergovernmental working group is to A, determine the necessity of some additional international legal initiative for the accountability of military contractors, and if they determine that there is um, a, what we we're calling a normative gap, then to recommend the solution. My working group has recommended a draft convention as a potential solution. Another possible solution that's being floated, instead of 
um, a, a new international convention is the explication of some kind of model domestic law that states could sign up to. Um, over the next year, couple of years, I suspect, um, there will continue to be negotiations um, within and outside of this, this intergovernmental working group on whether or not you know, any more normative developments are, are needed, and if so, what form they should take. Um, I can tell you that the United States and, uh, and some of, of its allies are against the concept of a new international convention. Their position has generally been, the U.S.'s position has generally been, that there, um, there is sufficient, um, there are sufficient legal mechanisms in situ for dealing with the problem of military contractors. Um, there are quite a number of other states that disagree. There's also disagreement even on the question of whether it is legitimate for there to be such a thing as a private military contractor. My working group takes no position you know, for or, or against that, um, but suffice it to say that if you can't even agree on whether you know, such a thing can and should exist, um, it's very difficult to come to terms on the question of regulating it and, and, and holding uh, you know, and, and creating mechanisms for accountability. So um, in essence, the bottom line is we have the Montreux document, we now have the code of conduct, and we may or may not have a mechanism in place soon that gives teeth to the code of conduct, but as I say, that is still a voluntary mechanism on the part of states. Um, and then we have the question of whether or not there will be a new international convention or a model law or some other way of you know, bringing national legislation um, into, a, um, into a frame in which the transnational problems um, that, that arise on account of the existence and use of private military contractors can be handled. After all, you may have a contracting company that is registered in state A. They may be recruiting <coughs> in state B. The recruits may be from state B. They may be of state C. And the activities of the contractor may be taking place in, in state D. So questions of, um, of a jurisdictional nature um, and, and the need for some uniformity among states about accountability and remedy mechanisms um, are important. The position of my working group, all five of us, is that new normative develop developments do need to take place in order for these accountability and, and, and remedy mechanisms um, that are required under international law to, uh, to be put into place. Um, how that turns out in, within the next couple of years, we'll see. And, um, and then after, then Katie, you're gonna talk about the domestic scene a bit, and then we can maybe talk a little bit more about how the domestic and international weave together and any other questions that you folks might have. Thank you. Thanks, Gabor. Okay. Um, I'm going to be speaking about some efforts that we've undertaken in U.S. courts to hold private military contractors accountable for a very specific set of violations, and that is torture and war crimes, internationally recognized norms, which the U.S. also has implemented in its domestic criminal code um, sanctions for in the context of Iraq and Abu Ghraib. But before I speak about the cases, so just a couple of comments in relation to Gabor's comments. Um, you know, we've seen this massive rise of the use of private military or security contractors in the last 10 years in Iraq, in Afghanistan, um, and elsewhere. We've seen contractors who are carrying out some of the traditional contractor activities that we think of, like you said, food services or logistics. Um, and to some extent, we've gotten comfortable with that. And I would just flag even there, we've seen challenges in the last 10 years in the context of holding contractors accountable or assigning accountability um, when contractors have been involved in something like driving in a convoy. We've had a series of cases in US courts brought by military who were harmed when a contractor was driving a convoy. 
We've had, um, we have a massive series of cases known as the burn pit litigation. This is against KBR um, for contractors who are hired to get rid of, of garbage. And there are claims that there were carcinogenics that were burned with, um, with many other things leading to poisonous fumes which has caused harm to uh, U.S. military service members. So we've also had cases against contractors for laying um, electricity lines where there have been people who have been electrocuted. So even this area that we think of as, as um, more traditional contractor services also has led to some contentious cases in the courts and some serious questions about who's accountable when harms occur. The sphere I'm going to talk about is more what we're seeing, the use of contractors as interpreters and interrogators. Um, this is something that we saw spike when the U.S. moved into Iraq um, and there started to be mass detentions in spring, summer 2003 and the U.S. realized that it just didn't have enough interpreters and interrogators and very quickly moved to raise the number of contractors. Um, there were two firms that were primarily hired, Khaki and Titan. Titan is part of L3 and is now L3. <coughs> Khaki was to provide interrogators and, and um, L3 interpreters. They were working in Abu Ghraib, um, assisting in interrogations, assisting in interpretations for in everything from arrest, intake, detention. Um, and one of the things that happened, the way we got involved in this litigation, in the early winter of 2004, a man named Haider Sala came to his family in Michigan. Mr. Sala is an Iraqi. He was born in Iraq. He had been arrested during the time of Saddam Hussein in the 80s, and he was detained and kept at Abu Ghraib. While there, he was severely tortured by Saddam Hussein's forces. He ended up seeking and receiving um, political asylum in Sweden and became a Swedish citizen. After the U.S. Uh, moved into Iraq, there was a call. You know, Iraqis come home, help rebuild your homeland. So Mr. Saleh went from Sweden and went back to uh, Iraq. And very shortly after arriving in Iraq, he was stopped at a checkpoint by U.S. military forces. He was speaking Swedish and Arabic. They were speaking English. There was communication challenges. Um, bottom line, he was detained, arrested, put into detention, and then blindfolded while he was in detention, realized that he ends up back in Abu Ghraib. And he said, you know, I'm, I came, I'm answering the call. I'm here to help rebuild my homeland. Why are you detaining me? I'm a Swedish citizen. Um, but Mr. Saleh ended up being detained for about five months. And during that time, he was kept naked, he was kept in contorted positions, he was beaten, he was sexually assaulted. At one point, there were a line of detainees who were uh, all kept naked, I mean, kept naked for most of the time. He had his penis tied to a string with a line of other detainees, and it was like a game of dominoes where the string would be pulled and that, down they would go. So. Finally, because in part of his Swedish citizenship, Mr. Saleh was released, and he went to Michigan where his mother and brother were. And he told them the story, and they said, this is crazy. You know, it sounds like you're having flashbacks to the time that you were detained under Saddam. This, you know, this would not have happened. You were, even if you were arrested by the U.S., you know, this kind of treatment would not have happened. But he kept insisting, no, this is what recently happened to me. And they contacted a local lawyer in Michigan, <coughs> Sharif Akil, who had been working on Arab American detention issues domestically in the post 9 11 um, moment. And Sharif has told the story. And again, at this point, it all just sounds so incredible. Sharif contacted us at the Center for Constitutional Rights. We had been, we've been for now a decade heavily involved in the Guantanamo litigation and rendition litigation. So. Sharif thought to, to bring the case to us. And again, you know, we, we were curious. It just didn't sound like what we had heard yet. Um, but Mr. Salas had come to Iraq, and you will meet more who have similar stories. 
So Sharif traveled to um, Iraq in the spring of 2004 and met 20 other former detainees, heard their accounts and realized that you know, they, what we're hearing is that there is a widespread problem here and some really serious violations going on. And sure enough, at that moment then, we had the Taguba report come out, which is the report that documented what was going on in Abu Ghraib. And we had these photos, which very much mirror what um, Mr. Sala was discussing as having happened to him and what he saw happen to others. So at that moment, um, reading through the Chaguba report, we had of course known that there was a, a good deal of outsourcing of what I would say are core governmental functions happening to contractors. And the Chaguba report and subsequently the Fay report identify khaki and Titan employees as having been part of the um, serious abuse, what I would say are allegations of torture against detainees. Um, and we felt that this was an important piece to bring the case uh, against the contractors to highlight their role um, in the, the violations. So we filed a case in June 2004, first out in California, alleging violations of international law under the Alien Tort Statute. So we brought case, claims of war crimes, torture, cruel and human integrating treatment, crimes against humanity. We also brought claims under domestic tort law. So sexual assault, uh, assault and battery, um, intentional infliction of emotional distress, negligent hiring and training, you know, lack of supervision, and this case wound its way through a number of different courts. For those who think that international law and human rights litigation in the U.S. is, is really exciting, a lot of it is federal practice. So the first maybe two years of this case was just about venue and, and where it would be heard. Um, exciting in its own right, but you know, not about the human rights issues. And eventually we ended up in the District of Columbia. And the main issue that really came before the court in the early years, and still continues seven or eight years later, is whether or not the contractors could benefit by, by something known as the government contractor defense. This is a judge-made uh, defense recognized in the decision, the Boyle decision. It was Judge Scalia who created this federal common law defense and created it in the context of a products liability case. In the Boyle case, essentially what the government contractor defense is, is if the government has hired a contractor to do something, make a helicopter, as was the case in Boyle, if the contractor has done the job in compliance with what the U.S. government has told them to do, if it's warned the government if there are any defects that it saw in the product design as it was going about building the product, then it wouldn't be right to hold the contractor accountable because ultimately it's the U.S. government who told them to do this. To some extent, that makes a lot of sense. Here what we have is contractors who are hired to provide interpretation and interrogation services. They are prohibited under U.S. law from engaging in combat. They are required under the terms of their contract to comply with U.S. law, including international law requirements of the Geneva Conventions, <coughs> Convention Against Torture that we've implemented through the anti-torture statute, the, the war crimes statute, essentially that they cannot torture and commit war crimes. So these are obligations that the contractors undertook. Um, and there were not orders um, and cannot be orders because torture is unlawful for the U.S. to <coughs> say, go do torture. As in the case of the government contractor defense, go build a helicopter. So this was the initial fight that came up, whether or not contractors could benefit from the government contractor defense. And Judge Robertson in the uh, District of Columbia District Court, what he said is, well, look, this is a very different case scenario than Boyle. Boyle is about products. This is about services. I'm going to pull a test out, analogize to Boyle, and say, were the contractors essentially operating as soldiers in all but name? Were they in the chain of command? Were they responsible and integrated into the forces? 
um, and thus can they be held accountable? And I think what Gabor already pointed out and actually pointed out in our litigation in an amicus brief is that contractors by definition are not combatants. They do not fall within the chain of command. So as a matter of law, I think it's extremely uh, challenging to see an answer that can satisfy Judge Robertson's test. What he tended to do was look more at the facts. In fact, were the contractors operating side by side with the military? Were they responding to orders by the military, even if they were outside the chain of command, even if they were outside the military justice system? Were they operating as soldiers? And what he ended up finding was that in the case of the interpreters, they were integrated and thus could not be held accountable. And in the case of the in interrogators, that they fell outside the chain of command completely because they responded to their, their supervisors, um, and thus the case could proceed. And I should point out that under federal regulations, the contractors are required to have supervisors who are overseeing their contractors. It's, they are not supposed to be having the military having to oversee their work. They are supposed to have their own um, their own chain of supervision. So Khaki appealed the ruling against them and we appealed the ruling against Titan. And all of this is just about the state law claims. I, if we have time, I can talk about the international law, ATS, Alien Tort Statute claims. Um, this went up to on appeal and ultimately on September 11th, 2009, in a two to one decision, uh, plaintiffs lost. Judges Kavanaugh and Silberman adjusted the test that Judge Robertson did and, and I would say greatly expanded it and essentially found that um, torts should not apply on the battlefield. <coughs> now we're talking about a detention center here, we're talking about Abu Ghraib and other detention sites, um, but somehow this, you know, the battlefield seemed to almost be all of Iraq and that it was just inappropriate to inject torts, i.e. accountability, which is something that you normally hold a corporation accountable by using tort law, but here in this context it was inappropriate. Um, and so there was a blanket preemption of the state law claims. It was a melding for those of you who take in federal practice um, of a conflict preemption, where you have a conflict between the federal obligation and the state law, and a field preemption where you have federal law kind of occupying the entire field and that was put together in this battlefield preemption. Um, so as I said, we lost there. We sought cert from the Supreme Court. Um, they invited the Obama administration to come in and weigh in on whether or not this case should be allowed to proceed. And the Obama administration at that point came in and said in the solid case that no, um, it was premature. There were a lot of contractor cases kicking around. We shouldn't address this now. So that effectively ended the case on behalf of 254 <coughs> plaintiffs. Initially, we had sought class certification. That had been denied um, by Judge Robertson in the TC court. So in the meantime, in 2008, we filed a series of other cases, one in the Eastern District of Virginia, one in the District Court of Maryland. In both these cases, the district court judges found that these cases could proceed, at least to discovery. So we survived the motion to dismiss. They largely rejected, in the case of Maryland, the battlefield preemption, finding it far too broad. Um, they also questioned whether or not the Boyle analysis could apply, because that would mean then that it was the government saying go torture which it can't say since that is unlawful. Um, cer certainly said that this is a, a complicated case, it raises important questions, but for now it can proceed. In the Eastern District of Virginia, the big issue that came up there was the political question doctrine and the question of whether or not it's appropriate for these cases to be dealt with in courts. Um, in both Maryland and Virginia, another issue is <coughs> derivative immunity and that's whether the immunity of the state can be passed on to contractors. Now, if you think about that, there are many, many contractors out there. There should be, or there is, a distinction between a contractor and a government employee. So if we're saying derivative immunity, 
where do we draw the lines? How do we draw that? What's the difference between um, a government official who's accountable to the citizenry and a private contractor who's hired, hired by a corporation and ultimately accountable to shareholders? So derivative immunity is a, another question that's looming out there. Um, both of these cases went up on interlocutory appeal to the Fourth Circuit in September of this year. Another two to one panel first decided that it had uh, jurisdiction over the interlocutory appeal, not because of the immunity issue. And for those who are, are looking at federal practice again, immunity is something that is often immediately appealable when it's a government um, actor. It's a unique scenario to have a derivative immunity on a behalf of a private corporation go up under immediate appeal. Not on the preemption issue, which is what the courts, uh, the majority in the Fourth Circuit ultimately found, that these cases, these state law claims could be preempted. We sought non banc review. We briefed through the fall after it was granted. We had oral argument at the end of January with the question before the panel being very much whether or not the Fourth Circuit is rightly seized with this appeal. Of course, in the context of that discussion, there were issues of whether these cases should be in federal court, whether they are somehow um, overstepping into national security, foreign policy. You know, you had some judges who were asking that, others who were saying, well, of course, they should be held accountable. Isn't it toward a normal course of action um, for a corporation? One significant thing I'll mention and then wrap up is that we had the Obama administration invited by the Fourth Circuit to weigh in. And we had a slightly different amicus brief this time than we did before the Supreme Court. And the Obama administration first said that it was premature appeal, and then secondly said that this case should be allowed to proceed. And the reason being that it involves claims of torture. So it said for those claims of torture, they would fall outside the government contractor defense or some kind of preemption that there is a, a federal interest in ensuring accountability for torture that has to be weighed against the federal interests of you know, not having the courts interfering with every use of, of contractors. Um, so the, the Obama administration, the Department of Justice, also had a lawyer at the Fourth Circuit who I think probably got some of the most challenging questions of anyone. Um, I would recommend, if you're really interested in this, listening to that oral argument, which is on the Fourth Circuit site and our, our site. And now we're waiting for a decision from the Fourth Circuit. Again, it may just be on the issue of um, jurisdiction. It may get in with separate opinions into the merits, or it might rule on the merits in the majority, so it's it's certainly a very, very live issue here. Thanks, Katie. Um, do you want to wrap up with Can one? Can I just make a, yeah. a comment to, <coughs> to bring some of that up. back mm -hmm. into, into the international legal realm? Mm -hmm. The single most important principle of the laws of armed conflict, law of war, um, is the principle of distinction. Distinction between what? Between combatants and civilians. Um, it's, it's, it's the kind of you know, human rights essence of the laws of war that you're allowed to target combatants, you're not allowed to target civilians. And um, commensurate with that, there's a, there's a concept of combat immunity for combatants. So if you're a member of the armed forces and you go and you, you know, kill a Taliban in, in Afghanistan, you cannot be charged with murder under Afghan law. You have immunity as a, as a combatant. Now, it's important to understand that what happened in these, in these cases was the extension of this concept of combat immunity, not only from members of the uniformed military to private contractors, but also the extension of that immunity into a situation that was not combat, into a situation that was detention. And the difference between combat and detention is huge under international law. In combat, there are circumstances under which you are allowed to kill people. But if they are civilians not participating in hostilities, or even if they were persons who had been participating in hostilities but are now in detention, they all fall within the rubric what we, uh, that we call hors de combat, no longer in combat and entitled to the full protections against the use of hostilities 
that any civilian who may never have had anything to do with the conflict are entitled to. So the extension of this essential combat-related immunity to contractors in the, in the context of detention, interrogation, not only you know, cuts way against the general concept of, uh, of the principle of distinction uh, because contractors are not combatants, but also because the context was not one of combat. Yeah, and, and just one more clarification, then we'll open it up on that. You know, likewise, the military cannot have immunity in a detention context when you're engaging in torture and war crimes. You know, we're not talking about questioning conduct which would have been lawful. The baseline here is that we're raising allegations of war crimes and torture. And if our allegations can are, are wrong, then let that be adjudicated on the merits and not at the premature stage of just cabining off and saying immunity.